So I want to start, I'm going to start initially by just doing a little bit of teaching before I really get into it. So what is prophecy? Well, at its most basic, it's a message from God. And it can be both foretelling, which is predicting future events, which is what a lot of people think all prophecy is, but actually, mostly, it's foretelling. And foretelling is, is really explaining the present from God's perspective and bringing strength to God's people to overcome. Derek Prince defines it like this. He says, the gift of prophecy is the supernaturally imparted ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and speak God's mind or counsel. And it's a bit different in the New Testament to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, prophets were specifically chosen and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they prophesied out of the Holy Spirit that was sitting upon them. The Holy Spirit wasn't indwelling in those days. But even then, even in those days, even when not everybody was able to prophesy, we hear the heart cry of the Father coming from the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Moses, where Moses says in Numbers 11, 29, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would place his spirit on them. So even then, that was the cry of God's heart. And then we read in Joel 2.28, hundreds and hundreds of years later, and afterwards, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. And that's picked up in the book of Acts by Peter when he references that scripture. And he says, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So the New Testament church is called to be prophetic from its very inception, from its birth. It's a prophetic, revelatory church. And no longer is this just for a chosen few. The gift of prophecy, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, is for all. And Paul said himself, I wish that you would all prophesy. And I'm, I'm just a, a quick caveat here. The gift of prophecy in Corinthians is, is different from the office of prophet mentioned in Ephesians 4. The office of prophet, is G, it's, it's the componential parts of Jesus it's the fivefold ministry gifts. It's where Jesus says he gave some to be. So you're called as a prophet from your mother's womb. But which, so we're not talking about that. We're to, I'm talking about the gift of prophecy that everybody can and should operate in. So the Greek word for prophecy is prophetia, and it's an amalgamation of two other words, pro meaning forth and femi meaning to speak. So what are we speaking when we prophesy? We are speaking forth the words of God. We are speaking the language of heaven. We are proclaiming heavenly truths. But we're not just speaking words, and this is really important to understand. We're releasing spirit. We are spirit beings, and our words are vehicles and carriers of spirit. And Jesus says in John 6, 63, that his words are spirit and they are life. So when Jesus speaks, his words are bringing life because he is life. He doesn't just come to bring life, he is life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And Revelation 19.10 tells us this, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So right here we learn that there is a spiritual power behind prophecy. What is that power? It's the ministry of the Holy Spirit illuminating the testimony of Jesus. And what is the testimony of Jesus? That he died, he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. That he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And that he came to destroy the works of the enemy. And I love Isaiah 61 where Jesus, this is speaking of Jesus, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, 
to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Hallelujah. So this is the testimony of Jesus. And when we prophesy, we are called to speak forth that testimony into the earth. And that testimony is what undoes and reverses the curse that sits over the earth and her inhabitants. It is a coming of heaven to earth. It's a proclamation and a declaration of the kingdom of God breaking out and breaking forth amongst us, manifesting in the here and now. It is the will of the Father being done on earth as it is in heaven. And all prophecy should testify and speak of and reveal this glorious testimony of Jesus. That should always be the motivation and the end goal. I don't think we've always seen that in the prophetic. We've seen a lot of politically biased prophecy and all sorts of rubbish. But, the t- but what we should be releasing when we prophesy is the testimony of Jesus. We should always reveal him. So 1 Corinthians 14.3, so we're in the New Testament again now, endorses this. The one who prophesies, this is the amplified in brackets, who interprets the divine will and purpose in inspired preaching and teaching speaks to men for their upbuilding and constructive spiritual progress and encouragement and consolation. So other translations say for um, comfort, edification, and exhortation. So that, is, that should always, when we prophesy this, it, the gift of prophecy, we should always be operating out of that place of seeking to encourage and build one another up. Really interestingly, speaking of the testimony of Jesus, the word in Greek is marturia, and it's where we get the word martyr from. So the testimony of Jesus is costly. It involves a laying down of life. It involves surrender. It involves the cross. If we want to be those who prophesy life, then we must also be those who walk the way of the cross who lay down our lives for the cause of Christ and the gospel. But did you know it's possible to prophesy out of another place, a place that does not bring life? Our words carry enormous creative power. It's how God made us. And the world understands this. I don't know how many of you have heard of a book called The Secret. It was... um, a global bestseller. It sold millions of copies. I'm not suggesting you go out and buy this book. (laughs) It's not a Christian book. Please don't go and buy it. But it takes the idea of Matthew 21, 22, and whatever things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. I mean, that sounds okay, doesn't it? It sounds godly enough. It's like, yeah, I'd like to receive the things that I ask for in prayer. But the thing is, the problem with this book is God is nowhere in the equation. And the subtitle of that book is, You Can Have, Do, or Be Anything You Want. Now, that to me sounds very similar to the primary tenet of Satanism, which is do as thou wilt. Ask, believe, receive. So this book teaches that if you imagine something hard enough, and if you declare it often enough, and if you thank the universe that it's on its way, and declare it a bit more, and do that often, so often that you can smell, touch, taste, and feel that thing, then you will manifest it in the earth. Because the thing is, what's going on there is that there's a, there's a spiritual law in operation because that power that we have in our mouths was not revoked when man fell. It's still in operation. But if you're doing it the secret way, the stuff that you're gonna get is not coming from heaven. It's coming from another place. And the the universe doesn't give freebies. At some point, you will pay a price. I feel like I'm actually speaking to someone here today when I talk about that. So we've just spoken about the spiritual power behind prophecy, which is the law of the spirit of life. So we also have to understand that there is another spiritual power vying for our words. And it's the spiritual power that works in the world. It comes from Satan. 
John 5, 19 says the whole world is in the grip of the evil one. And it, this power entices you to think that you can have what you want and that you can make things happen apart from God. It has control at its core. And it's the natural religion of man in rebellion to the creator. And it's spirit beings engaging with the spirit world in ways that, in practice, ignore God's reality. And I need to tell you, it's not just people who read The Secret and operate in paganism and affirmations and manifesting stuff. We all engaged in a battle with this power because it's the war between spirit and flesh. What is this power that sits behind this spiritual law? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians 3, 1 to 3, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? That word bewitch means to cast an evil spell, to bewitch through the use of an evil power. We're talking about the power of witchcraft. And what were the Galatians doing that Paul brought such a strong word to them? Well, they weren't being accused of starting up a coven or casting spells, or drawing a big, a big pentagram on the floor, as far as we know, they were being accused of attempting to earn their salvation through the law and through means of the flesh. And Paul says, you've been bewitched. You're under a spell. You're under witchcraft. And in Galatians 5.20, Paul lists witchcraft as the work of the flesh. The acts of the flesh or the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. Who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched us? Before our eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. The main aim of witchcraft is to obscure the work of the cross. I think when I talk about witchcraft, some of you are right on board with me, all the Africans. <laughs> I think the white people, probably not quite so much. Some of you looking at me like this is a bit woo-woo. And you know, when I first started preparing this talk, I was going in a total different direction. I had no idea that I would be speaking about this but I, the Lord led me into it, and I just felt the Holy Spirit all over it. Because we need to talk about it. We need to call it out in the church. The church today, the Western church in particular, is coming wholesale under the power of witchcraft and doesn't even know it. They're not even aware of it. There's an ancient war in the church between the house of Saul and the house of David that is reaching its culmination in these days. Saul is a type of the man of flesh, carnal man, who hearkened to the people and not to God. He was in rebellion against God's ways and God's methods. And the prophet Samuel, when he confronted him, said this, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's 1 Samuel 15, 22 to 23. And the very well-known and very anointed Bible teacher that I, I referenced before, and I think Mark has mentioned him a few times, he says this, Witchcraft in the church results in legalism. It reinstates the illegitimate dominion of flesh over spirits. It produces slaves instead of sons. And this is what we get in the church when we operate in the illegitimate dominion of flesh. We get carnal instead of spiritual. We get Ishmael instead of Isaac. We get theology instead of revelation. We get education instead of discipline. 
We get psychology instead of discernment. We get programs instead of supernatural direction. We get eloquence instead of spiritual power. We get reasoning instead of a walk of faith. And we get legalism instead of love. <laughs> Do they sound familiar? <laughs> Isn't where much of the church has been at? Isn't this our battle? It's my battle. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 18 says this. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, but you must be blameless before the Lord. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. So that verse that I've just read, it's speaking of the power arm of witchcraft, and that is certainly coming against the church too. But how can we withstand that ungodly power? You know, I'm talking spells. You know that there is covens, and their sole aim is to cast spells and bring hexes against the church. I don't know if you're aware of that. They've got cursing calendars. How can we withstand that evil power if we're walking in the flesh? Because it's the same spirit. It's coming from the same place. But God has an answer. He's got an answer to witchcraft, and it is to raise up a prophetic people, and it's to put his words in their mouths. So church, if we are to be those who walk in freedom from the control of our own flesh, and I so want that. I'm fed up with my own flesh. <laughs> you know, I, I identify with Paul, who says, you know, who will help me, wretched man that I am, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, these I do. Who will help me? I so identify with that. But if we're to be those who walk in freedom from the control of our own flesh and the spirit of legalism, and dead works and witchcraft, then we must be a prophetic revelatory church because that is where the power is. So I want to speak a little bit about how to do that. So this is, it's about looking and listening. It's about seeking the will of the Father. It's about agreeing with it. It's about walking in intimacy. John 5, 19 says this, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son does also. Jesus only did what he saw the father doing. He took soul direction and inspiration from heaven, not from the earth. Not once did Jesus operate in the flesh. He operated in the true spirit of prophecy, speaking words of life and bringing them to heaven. Sorry, bring, speaking words of life and bringing heaven to earth. God is always speaking, but are we listening? Are we, are we looking to see what the Father is doing? I believe that we're called to be like John the Revelator in Revelation 4.1 in these days, where John says he looked and he saw a door standing open in heaven, and he heard a voice saying, come up here. We're not going to find revelation on the horizontal plane. We're not going to find it in the things and the wisdom of the world, which James tells us is on a downwards trajectory from sensual to earthly, sorry, earthly to sensual to demonic. We're only going to find revelation and wisdom from heaven in the heavenly realms. And Jesus sought the will of the Father. He didn't seek his own will. He said, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just.
because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I think the account of Mary and Joseph concerning the conception of Jesus is so instructive. Mary's response to the angel who informed her she was with child was this. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And then Joseph, to whom Mary was betrothed, he was thinking of quietly divorcing her. He was thinking, gosh, this is a scandal. You know, this woman that I'm betrothed to, has seemed, she's got herself pregnant. How has that happened? So he was, he was an honorable man, and he was thinking of quietly divorcing her. But he had a dream, and this is what it says, Matthew 1, 20 to 21. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. What was conceived in her? The word of God, the word made flesh. The word was conceived in her. And I have a question for you today. Has what is in you been conceived by the Holy Spirit? You see, the word of God, when it comes to you, when it comes to us, has the power to conceive life. And the place of conception is the place of intimacy. It's the place where the spirit of the living God breathes into your spirit. But it requires something from us. It requires something from you. We're not robots the Spirit of God doesn't come and just shove us around, you know, without us, um, with, you know, without our will being engaged. Your agreement is required. Your yes is required. Mary yielded. She gave her yes, and she didn't have to. She had a choice. And her response, Lord, may it be done to me, as you have said, was costly to her. She knew what it could mean. It could mean public disgrace stoning as an adulteress. But she chose the way of the cross, not my will, but your will be done. And we know that scripture, don't we, that speaks about where two or more are in agreement, whatsoever they ask will be done for them by our Father in heaven. But is there agreement on the inside of you? Are your mind and your thoughts and your preferences and your ideas Are they yielded to the spirit of the living God within you? Or are you debating and arguing, complaining? Are we a people of the flesh or a people of the spirit? We don't want to be a stiff-necked people who when the word of God comes, we turn our faces the other way and say no. We have to yield. We can't truly release the word of God unless it's first been conceived within us. We can speak words but we can't release the life-giving spirit of God where there's been no conception in the intimate place with him. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Do you know that word filthy rags, what it means? It's a soiled menstrual cloth. Sorry about that, all the men are wincing. (laughs) And I asked the Lord, I was like, God, why so graphic? Couldn't you not have picked something else? And I'm immediately, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And he said, because that which should have nurtured life has not nurtured life, but has been discarded from the body as waste. Why? Because there was no intimacy. Because there was no conception. Now... (laughs) Ladies, I'm not suggesting that you be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen (laughs) 24-7, having endless children. But I want to contrast that scripture with Isaiah 26, 18. It says this, we have been with child, we've been writhing and in pain, but we have, as it were, brought forth only wind. We have not brought any deliverance in the earth, and the inhabitants of the world have not been born. Sorry to be covering all the unpleasant bodily functions today. (laughs) But it bears repeating, if if the words we speak 
are to bring forth life and bear fruit, then they must first be conceived within us by the spirit of the living God. It's not blab it and grab it. It's not take words out of context and use them to manifest what you want. That's magic. And people do that. You know, I've seen people on Instagram, you know, how to get this particular thing, use this scripture, and then they're speaking about manifesting. But I think we've done it in the church as well because we've just sought to do things on our own strength. In Matthew 16, Jesus and Peter have a conversation. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replies and says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I've preached on this before, and I used to read this, and I used to process that intellectually and think, Okay, I get that. But then the Holy Spirit opened my eyes and I began to see that this is not a fact to be known intellectually and kind of filed away somewhere, but it's speaking of the continual, ongoing, ever-present revelation of Jesus, that he is the Christ, that he is the anointed one. And it's the moment by moment pressing in of the Father and that invitation of his to come away with him, to linger with him, because he wants to reveal to us the mysteries of heaven, and he wants to reveal to us the testimony of his son, Jesus Christ, in ever-expanding measure, in ever-increasing measure. And we will get to the end of, well, we won't get to the end of eternity because it's eternal, but all of eternity will not be able to unpack the fullness of the mysteries of Christ and the fullness of his testimony. It's an ongoing revelation. And Jesus tells Peter that what was revealed was not from flesh and blood, but it came from the Father in heaven. It was divinely inspired and it was a place of building. We need structures and buildings and shelter because we live on earth and because it rains a lot. (laughs) I mean, thankfully not today. But this building is not the church. We are the church. And that church, us, is built by revelation. It's the opposite of legalism and, it's the, and the operations of witchcraft. It's the place of intimacy with the Father and it produces sons instead of slaves and it restores the dominion of spirit over flesh. We're built up by the power of revelation and we build each other up in this place too. And when it comes from heaven, when it comes from the Father, there is life in it and the gates of hell cannot push back against it. They cannot withstand. They cannot operate against the church, the true church of Jesus Christ, moving in that power. I just want to make one more point before I close. I I do believe the Lord is restoring the prophetic in his church. I mean, I mentioned earlier about, you know, prophets for profit, and we've had so much of that, and the Lord is done with it. And I don't think it's going to any longer be about big names and celebrity. It's not going to be any more about lines of people queuing up to get a word from the the prophet because they haven't bothered to hear from God for themselves. It's not going to be prophets with a political agenda. I believe what the Lord is doing is he is establishing companies of prophets and communities of prophetic people in his church. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel. This is the story of when David was fleeing King Saul, who was trying to kill him with spears. 1 Samuel 18, 19 to 24. When David had fled and made his escape, he went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel went to Naoth and stayed there. Word came to Saul David is in Naoth at Ramah, so he sent men to capture him. But when they saw a group of prophets prophesying with Samuel standing there as their leader, 
the Spirit of God came on Saul's men and they also prophesied. Saul was told about it and he sent more men and they prophesied too. Saul sent men a third time and they also prophesied. And finally he himself left for Amar and went to the great cistern at Seku. And he asked, where are Samuel and David? Over in Naoth at Ramah, they said. So Saul went to Naoth at Ramah, but the Spirit of God came even on him. And he walked along prophesying until he came to Naoth. He stripped off his garments and he too prophesied in Samuel's presence. He lay naked all that day and all that night. This is why people say, is Saul also among the prophets? And earlier on, I spoke about Saul being a type of the man of flesh, a type of carnal man, the one that hearkens in rebellion, hearkens to the voice of man instead of the voice of God, and because of it comes under the power of witchcraft. And that is where much of the church in this country is. It's the spirit of the age, hearkening to the voice of the people and not hearkening to the voice of God. There's a pressure that is coming against the church in this day to conform and to be like the world. But we're not called to conform to the ways of the world. We're called to be separate. We're called to be a people who listen to the voice of God, who look to see what he's doing, who hear and listen and hear his words. And God is raising up a prophetic people. He's doing it in this place, who operate in intimacy with Jesus, people who linger with him, are people who have conceived his words in their spirit because they've given their yes, because they've moved in surrender, A people who build with revelation and speak forth the testimony of Jesus into the earth, A people who have put off filthy rags and who walk in righteousness. Because you know what, when these ones, when the prophetic ones, and that is all of us, when we move in that power of prophecy and revelation, in agreement, in the place of unity, there is a power there that destroys the works of the flesh, that confronts, exposes, and disarms the power of witchcraft. Saul came up against David with a murderous spirit. He was going there to kill him. He wasn't going there to have a conversation and a cup of tea. He was going there to slaughter him. And he couldn't do it because there was power in the prophets prophesying. He sent three lots of people to do it, and and they came under the power of the the prophets who were prophesying, the power of the spirit of life. So he went himself. Same thing happened to him. That murderous intent was totally disarmed. And this is the battle we're in in the church today. It's that battle of, of flesh against spirit, of hearkening to the voice of the people and not hearkening to God. You can feel it, can't you? You can feel it pressing in the atmosphere. But that spirit that Saul came with, that spirit of witchcraft, became utterly ineffective under the power of their words, under the power and the anointing of their corporate prophesying. Do we wonder that we've had so much opposition when we look at the state of the world? There is this power that is being unleashed against the true church, against the Davids. God is raising up a Davidic people in this place. Those who worship in spirit and in truth. Those who, those who are sold out for the Lord. Those who say, God, will you examine me? Will you see if there is any offensive way in me? Will you lead me in the way everlasting? Are people who seek the Father's heart. He's raising up a people like that in this place. Thank God. Thank God. (laughs) I believe that he's raising an army in this place. He's preparing a people for war. A people who operate with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. An army of expert swords people. I finished the talk, but I think I want to end... If we could all stand, I want to lead us in a prayer of repentance, if that's okay.